See, every one of those dings would be a would be my rim getting ruined. Oh, you got it. Welcome to the Bleepin' Jeep Christmas special. We're gonna do beadlock wheels. I'm gonna try to make my own fender flares. And do a little folding chop. Stay tuned. Bon Natale. I don't know if you guys can see that. So I ended up having to just go ahead and buy new calipers. I tried everything to get them out. Trust me, fire, easy outs, drill bits, every type of penetrant you can think of, nothing was working. Even when I was welding the nuts on, I just kept breaking off the bleeder. So what I ended up doing is just buying new calipers. I'm gonna go ahead and gravity bleed them. If you've never done that before, what you have to do is just open up your master cylinder so you can get air out because it's a vacuum seal and then you just open up all your bleeders and you just wait till that air works its way up the fluid will work its way down because it's heavier and once you see it leaking you just shut that specific bleeder off once you have all four of them then you can go back and get a little help to push the last little bits of air out but that'll get the majority out without having to get anybody else to help you when you're by yourself when you're bleeding your brakes you always want to start with the farthest the farthest brake from the master cylinder. So I'm getting kind of tired of the Cherokee looking like that. So boom, race line monsters, Mile Star Patagonia 37s. Bing! Feliz Natal. So since I put the race lines on my Samurai, I've beat the snot out of that thing, run it into rocks and everything else. And I've been really, really, really happy with these wheels. Cause I don't know what these rings are made of, if they're animanium or what. So I had to get another set for the Cherokee, but if you look at these rock rings, I got the exact same, basically the exact same wheel. The exact same wheel, the monster bead locks, I just went with a different offset. And I'll show you guys how that works. Let's break down a few simple things about wheels. A tire normally mounts against this bead, the bead against here, and the bead here. But because it's a bead lock, it's going to go inside here and get pinched. That keeps it from losing air. Now the inside of these race lines have a nice rib right here, and that keeps that tire from burping in, which happens sometimes on certain bead locks when you're running low air pressure. The width of your wheel is measured from where your tire bead mounts. Now the tire bead on this is going to mount here. Normally on a wheel you'll measure it here. This is a nine and a half inch wheel. Now backspacing is measured the same way. A backspace is measured from where the tire bead sits to where the face of the wheel is, which is right here. Where the face of this wheel is to, to where the tire bead sits is your backspace. A lot of people mistake it for out here and that's not correct. That's incorrect. So as you can see right here, it looks like there's four inches to the face of that wheel but you gotta take out that much, which means we have a three and a half inch backspace on this wheel. So when you're sitting here and you're trying to figure out how far your tire swing is gonna be, I have three and a half inches of tire inside from my wheel mounting surface and everything else from that nine and a half inch wheel is gonna be outside this way. So I know that my swing is gonna be wider, but I actually like that stance because I kind of believe in the old Pontiac method, wider is better and that helps with stability when you go higher. Mounting up tires on bead locks is pretty simple. Really all you need, a spray bottle with soapy water, a hammer, which I prefer a dead blow, and a half inch socket to tighten up the bead locks. And I'm gonna show how easy it is by having my wife do it. I know you've helped me, but have you ever mounted bead locks before by yourself? Yeah. First thing we gotta do is decide which side of the tire we're gonna use. Are we gonna do it where you can't see anything, or are we gonna do the white letters out? White letters out it is. That way you can actually see what you're running. <laughs> so you want to spray the inside of this tire all around here where the tire is going to mount on. Get it nice and soapy. Then set it down on the wheel. So what you want to do is get your wheel tight in here as tight to the tire as you can. I like to put a little foot pressure on it. And then you tap that tire bead. See every one of those dings would be a would be my rim getting ruined. <laughs> there is one other way, especially with beadlock wheels because they don't have the full rib. You can sometimes just slide them on, where if I just put pressure on it, I can do it, but it does take some weight and some muscle. And not, sometimes I don't always feel like that, but fortunately I always have the weight. But you can set that there. 
sometimes. You can just do There you go. You can get it that way. <laughs> Good day, mate. Merry Christmas. Oh. oh, you got it. All right, now we got to set the wheel up on the bucket. In case you're wondering, this is why you want to sit on a bucket. That way you can get the tire sitting inside that bead ring. And that way it's going to be a lot easier to mount up the bead lock ring once you bolt everything down. One of the things I really like about these race lines is some, some companies actually thread the aluminum. The problem with that is if you were to ever strip it out, over torque it or anything else, now you're going to have to run a Healy coil or have somebody TIG weld it where race line runs these little nut certs. And so if you ever were to strip that out or ruin it, you could just get a little nut cert and it comes with two extras for every wheel. But if you're ever to ruin it, you can just set it back, set it back in there and suck it in. So one of the things I forgot to mention is that tire companies actually balance tires out before they send them off. And this is what I'm talking about. So right here on the side of the tire is a yellow dot. That means that it is the heaviest part of the tire. Uh, if there was a red dot, that means it'd be the lightest part. There was not a red dot on these tires, so I decided to go with yellow dots for all four of them. If you line one of the dots up with your valve stem, what that's going to do is help that tire tech when you bring them in to have them balanced. They're going to be very appreciative that they know where that weight is. This is kind of a lost art due to dynamic tire balancing machines, but I still like to do it this way. Now, do you care about your clothes at all that you're wearing? Because now's the time we're going to be doing anti-seize on these bolts and anti-seize gets everywhere realistically anti-seize is only important for the second guy you don't have to put a lot it's just a dab just a dab will do you yep yeah. see you're gonna get it everywhere yeah. it's already on you <laughs> so if you can get one in each basically each quadrant if you split it into four quadrants if you get one started in each quadrant then all your holes are going to be lined up for the rest of your bolts police navy dad So it doesn't take much for these bolts to actually hold this bead on. You don't need to tighten them down crazy tight. You only need 16 to 18 foot pounds, which we'll torque up later. But when you go to set them on, I like to just lightly zip it. Obviously, if you're not comfortable or you only have a big impact or something like that where you can't turn it way down, then you want to use something much, much uh, lighter, like maybe just a hand wrench. But I like to get the four like I was saying, and then just kind of work my way across. And just like you would on a wheel, when you tighten up a wheel, you do the same with the bead lock and just kind of work your way across. And that way you're kind of equally cinching it on and then we'll torque it on the same way. You know what this is? Torque. You know how to set it up? Yeah. Okay. So on each side of here, you have Newton meters on this side, which we don't do that because we're not in Canada, we're in the US. And this is foot pounds. So we're gonna torque it to from 16 to 18 foot pounds. You see all these numbers here? It's like a little Christmas tree. And each one comes down into that line. So you gotta have this base here lined up in between the 15 and the 20. Oh, okay. The way I do it makes it the easiest for me is I'll start here at the valve core, the valve stem. So I know I go straight across there, and then I go inside like the race line. That way I know I'm getting the four to start, and then you can just start crisscrossing it. Ready to fill it with air? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so one thing we don't have to do when you're airing up a tire, but it helps tire it helps seat the bead quicker, is taking the valve core out. So if you want to take the valve stem cap off. This is a valve core tool right here. You can get those at any auto parts store, or hardware store, or even tractor supplies. Yeah, so you see how there's a flat spot. Oof. Focus. If you see there's a flat spot there, that's where that sits in that notch of that. And that's how you tighten it. Loosen it and tighten it. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be very tight. It just has to be enough for this little rubber O-ring on here to seat and hold the air pressure. You can go ahead and put air to it. All I'm doing is holding my hand here and pushing my foot against the wheel so it gets, so it has pressure. So it's got pressure. <laughs> now 
Now don't stick your finger in there. Yeah. Now you just keep airing it up because the fastest way it's gonna air up is without that valve core slowing it down. I like to keep my fingers on that little notch when I go to set this in, otherwise you're gonna blow this valve core out of your hand and you're gonna lose it. So here, no, don't, hold on to this first. You got your finger on it, you gotta pinch it between your fingers. Yes. Yep, okay, now you can take take your right hand and take that off and then get, fast. yep, you wanna probably do it as fast as you can. Scary. Did it scare you? Yes, I didn't expect it to be that forceful. <laughs> there you go. Now we can put that back on and, and check the air and make sure we got 35 PSI. Okay. So if you're ever wondering what a tire needs for PSI, they will always have it right here, usually by the load range. And right here it'll tell you 50 PSI. So 50 PSI is the max you want to put in this tire. Now this is a D-rated tire, which is a heck of a lot more than that little Cherokee's gonna need. All right, well Shannon mounted her first bead lock by herself. We'll go ahead and get the other four done. We won't bore you with that, then we'll jump on mounting them up and then see how much we actually have to trim off these fenders. What'd you think? It was easier than I thought it was gonna be. <laughs> So I definitely got to cut up my fenders to make those tires fit, which is pretty standard with every Cherokee for sure. In this case, I want to try something different, something I've never done. And I went down to my local salvage yard and I grabbed more fender flares. And what I'm going to try to do is take two fender flares for each single fender, cut it up, plastic weld it, and see if I can make a stock looking fender that's cut out for a bigger tire. So what I went ahead and did is took my fender flare, put it up here where I actually want it to sit, and then took a Sharpie and marked it. Now obviously at this point, I'm gonna have to cut this fender flare, use a second one from here to come out this way to match this, and then cut it up with two pieces again to make it go down far enough to reach. My goal is to make it look factory while still being much bigger. One of the things I definitely have to remember is that this is the top part and it mounts down here. Now I can drill a hole anywhere in here. I don't have to come down to the bottom here, but this is where I want to be. So if I'm going to mark it, I need to mark my fender cut down at this point. Quick measurement shows me that I need two inches inside my fender well cut. What I'm going to do is go ahead and just take my my uh, lock here, lock this down at two inches, take my Sharpie and just kind of give myself a faux line of where I want to cut. Now nobody's ever really going to see this uh, except me and you. Or you know the old adage, there's more than one way to skin a cat? I really don't know that because I don't think I've ever skinned a cat that I can recall. but. You can cut these fenders out with saws, awls, hacksaws, whatever feels, whatever you feel comfortable with, plasma cutters if you have one. Yeah, torches, you know, just pay attention to the backlash of the fire. I normally like to use a cutoff wheel and a safety squint, so that's what we're going to do. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, YouTube. I'm not going to just use a safety squint. I'll get my safety glasses. Calm down. Ta-da! That should work. So if you never plastic welded before, it's a pretty simple concept. You're basically just melting the plastic together. Uh, we are gonna reinforce it. I have some of this mesh that I will cut down and put back on the inside, no different than if you're doing fiberglass work. But out here, all I have ever used is literally zip ties. This is a soldering iron, but it's, it's for wood branding. One of the things you got to remember with the plastic is you got to give it a chance to cool off. Otherwise, it's going to crack right away. The concept is no different than welding. You want to get both pieces hot and then seam them together. So I work my way from one side over and then I work my way from the other side back. And that way everything is melted, everything is fresh, everything is hot, and then it kind of intertwines the two pieces of plastic together. 
This works really good if you ever back into something in the store and put a little nick in that plastic bumper. You go home and you fix it, and that way you don't have to blame it on your wife for doing it. Joy Noel. So it's not real pretty, but what I was doing was just working, working the plastic, heating it up, working onto this side, then work the plastic heat on this side, and then I just come back through and swirl it together, basically creating an equal amount of weld all the way across. Now, if this was the outside, I'm going to be a lot more fancy with it. I'm going to be cleaner, and then I'll soft sand it, wet sand it, and then clean it up. But in this case, for what I got, this is going to work really well. I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more in here, and then I'm going to put this mesh, I'm going to cut this mesh down and actually heat it up and put that mesh in here. And that's going to rigidify this thing from being able to uh, break. Because right now, just like with metal welding, once you've, once you've heated it up, now your weak points are it right here. I'm holding pressure down next to the soldering iron and then pressing the soldering iron onto the mesh. I got this piece, which was the original piece for this one. I'm going to put it here and then I just got to mark the point of where I cut and we'll cut it and plastic weld that. Can you guys see that? That sunset is rocking straight up. Day two of working on this, kind of doing this plastic weld. Took a little, took a little bit, took a little bit longer than I thought it was gonna. I mean, it takes some time to, to actually get it to seam in there real good. But I wanted to show you what I'm gonna do here. So right here is where I'm gonna cut everything. And let's check it out. So basically what I'm gonna do is where this white line is here, I'm gonna cut this off completely. That rib is not needed. This seam here, where this fold is, is where the inner fender well and the outer fender are seamed together from this point up, they're apart. So when I go to cut this, I'm gonna cut uh, pie slices out of here, but then I'm just gonna come straight up where it's open. So that way when I hammer this in and fold it, every bit will be folded and it'll still have a good seam keeping the inner fender well and the outer fender together. And then we'll get down here and we're gonna do a cut and fold on this part. First thing I wanna do is get rid of this piece of plastic, this body molding. So I have, uh, Mighty Mouse's pry bar here and all I'm going to do is just kind of set it under. This would probably be a lot easier if it wasn't zero degrees out and starting to snow but you know that's what happens when you live where I live so anyway it's still coming off pretty good all right so as you can see I notched everything out and then cut it with the sawzall up into the inner fender well. And I'll get a little zoom in here so you can see where I've cut it. They have a couple options here. You can use uh, what I used to dub as the purse, which works really good, or my go-to now, which is the Tanya Harding 300. That's right, I'm paying attention to you Vice Grip Garage. Your little one's only a 200, this is a 300. <laughs> So as you can see, the fender opening got much, much, much larger. Now I did go back to uh, old trusty here, my big old ball peen, to really peen that up in there and uh, massage that metal up inside. And now you can kind of see how it just folds up in there. This weather, I am getting, look at this. And I know you can't feel the cold, but our high yesterday was six degrees and it is not getting warmer right now. I started this project outside because we had had, uh, you know, a couple days of nice weather, but I may have to uh, hinder what I'm doing here pretty quick and move this thing inside because I'm getting a little turtled up. So I got to take a quick break here. Um, ran out of time. Weather's getting bad. Had to bring it in. And we have a basketball tournament to head to in Wyoming. So we're going to go do that. And then we'll get back on this. A 6'6 six, six senior, number 21, Ian Cluley. Alright, 
well, we got back from the basketball games in Wyoming. While I was gone, we had a nice big snowstorm. I spent all day uh, trying to plow, plow my driveway out. And it was a good thing I brought the Jeep in because it was actually uh, absolutely miserable out there. I only got stuff like 13 times. But the mail came in and I got some cool stuff. I like to put stickers in my Samurai inside the roof of all my friends that I wheel with and stuff. And I always give uh, Matt Wetzel, Matt's Off-Road Recovery, grief because they never have stickers when I show up. And so they mailed me. <laughs> I just wanted one. <laughs> they mailed me a bunch. So I want to say thanks to Matt's Off-Road Recovery for that. And uh, got some cool stuff from my friends at Clemson 4-Wheel Drive. They gave me a couple a couple koozies. And check out these cool shirts they got. And you can get them at uh, Clemson 4-Wheel Drive. I thought that was pretty cool. Thanks guys, I appreciate that. But you know this wouldn't be a Christmas special unless we give away some presents, right? So I want to talk to you guys real quick about our social medias. If you guys don't follow our social medias, you should. It's Bleepin' Jeep and on Instagram. It's bleepinjeep.com on Facebook. We also have Club Bleepin' Jeep where you can learn and talk to each other about stuff you're working on on Facebook. We also have Bleepin' Jeep Approved and then my own personal one, Bleepin' Colt, which is also on Instagram and Facebook. But on the day of this video, I'm going to drop one picture on Instagram and Facebook on the Bleepin' Jeep pages. Make sure that you comment on those and comment on this video too. And I'm going to pick one winner the first week after this video comes out. Then we're going to send you some Christmas swag. So uh, one winner from Instagram, one winner from Facebook, one winner from this YouTube video itself. And I'm going to send you guys some Bleepin' Jeep swag. We thank you guys for what you do. So I want to go from here straight across. I want to fold this metal up. So all I did was measure from the outside point here to here, which is four and three quarter inches, came from here down to here, and went just about four and seven eighths. That way I have a little bit extra. And then I cut, marked my line all the way across flat. I know I can get rid of all that. And I'm gonna cut this up here. I'm gonna make a straight cut across here, cut this out. This piece should come out. I'm gonna have to cut inside there and just cut it all the way across too. And then we can pull that inner piece out. And then we'll take this, Hopefully I can get the inner part out of this out so I just have this lip and we'll fold it up and use that lip as our guide to weld it on up there. All we got left is to cut that inner line out. Alright so I cut this section out, I cut the back piece out low and then what we can do here is I can just, I'm going to have to trim this a little more but we'll take this part, fold it up. And what that'll do is that'll create a nice welding point for when we fold this side up. And if you've uh, had one of these that's already all rusted up, then you can always just cut it straight off, which I've done before in the past, and then just get a piece of plate that you cut to fit in here and then just weld it in. But I like to use what I already have because this is free. So it's tacked on, you can see, I mean that, you can see how far that sits down below here. We just gained an astronomical amount of departure angle coming off the tire going up. So I'll still have to build a bumper that fits up under here. That will probably be about an inch and a half, two inches here. Cause I want to make sure that it's structurally strong and going to protect the tail light that's going to stick out here. But you can see how much clearance we got anyway. I just gotta finish tacking it up and then let's get on this fender well. So I took my points here and I just marked them up here on the body. And all I'm gonna do is drill it out and then put these little nut certs in there. As you can see, we have a big fat fender opening. Winning. Now that we got this side pretty much buttoned up, I'll finish up the little bits. I'll work on the other side. I'm not going to bore you guys with that. I hope you guys have a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year. I'll see you guys next time. You know, we've had a great year. You guys did an awesome job uh, with the Utleys and their rollover. Uh, that last time I looked, they're at almost $10,000 that you guys have donated to them. So we really do appreciate that. Uh, that's going to go to a lot to maybe to help their Jeep or to help pay their medical bills. You know, that's going to, that means a lot. So we really do appreciate you guys. I hope you guys have a Merry Christmas. Thanks.